We're going to read tonight in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. We're at the halfway stage of our series, and it's fitting that women should be at the centre of it. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise. Dwell with them with understanding, giving honour to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. We're moving on to the theme tonight of the grace of God that's reciprocated in marriage. We've been making our way slowly. Uh, in the opening up of chapter 1, to see the grace that was eternal and sacrificial, that the God of eternity planned it so, that in the stepping down of his Son, you and I would be reached through his sacrifice, and in the perfect offering of himself to God, he would bring you and me into the glory, not only of the grace that was brought to us, in the sacrificial nature of the Saviour, but grace that is further to be revealed at his coming when it will be eternal and while we will cease uh, needing to walk by faith. At last we will walk by sight in the presence of the Saviour, but grace will continue. Isn't it marvellous? He never runs out. No wonder dear old Danny Johnson says, uh, his love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power no boundaries known unto man, but out of the infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we open up chapter 1 of Peter's letter, and I'm, I suppose that you've opened many a letter in your day, and you've leafed through the pages, and hopefully by the time you get to page 3, you haven't forgotten the contents of pages 1 and 2. Now it's like that in our Bibles as well, that there's a letter, the accumulated force of which means that we need always to be bringing with us all that has been said in the previous chapters, so that we step out of chapter 1 and God opens up something new for us. He's bringing us to the grandeur of his salvation. And you look at chapter 1 and you say, I'm there. I'm in it from beginning to end. And you step out of chapter 1 with divine permission that the great God of eternity, who in his foreknowledge called us at last in time, has opened up a doorway into the service of chapter 2. But the amazing thing is, that just as chapter 1 opens the door of chapter 2, chapter 2 opens the door of chapter 3. And you can follow the sequence that he's been dealing with the eternal and sacrificial grace. And then he begins in the second chapter to outline the purpose of that. That you and I would be in the Word that we would be in worship, that we would be in witness, that we'd be in the world to testify, 
that we would be careful in our walk and in our work and as if we needed another W. Peter in the marvel of the English language in chapter 3 opens with the word wives. So he gives the final W. When God was doing that, he had something in mind. He's opening a door in chapter 1 that points us upward. And in that upward look, we see the eternal glory of the grace of God that you and I have received in the gospel. And through that salvation, I step into the service context of chapter 2. And in that new realm that I never knew before, I know the experience of what we refer to as experimental grace. I know you prefer the word experiential. I prefer the word experimental. For this reason, that God is proving to us in chapter 2 that out of the delights of the word, theology is being proved in the day-by-day -day experimentation of your life, just as you would in the science lab. When you add uh, one chemical to another, it's the experiment of discovering the rightness of the theory. There's no theory here, there's theology here. And as we come to it, God allows us to know the daily experiment of the reality of Christ being with us in every dimension. So when you come to uh, the thought of your witness, God's moved us from focusing on all that is upward, but I keep my eyes there and I hold out my hands to the world and all its need. And in that, he never wants me to forget that he has something more in mind. And he takes us at last into chapter 3 and we discover that he moves from his house to your house. It's the marvel that the God of chapter 1 is the God of the eternal home. In my father's house. It's always been there. The Lord Jesus returned to it to prepare a place. But it was always there. And then he stepped down in chapter 2 to establish a house on earth, to invite us in there to be at home with him in the spiritual service that he's outlining to us. And if that isn't good enough, he says, just let me know your address because I want to come and knock on your door. And just as you've come into my house, I want you to welcome me into yours. Come with thy light divine into each room to shine. Master, the house is thine. Search thou and see. Now I know fine well all the trouble that you've gone to to tidy your homes just because I'm here. <laughs> That's presumption, isn't it? You know? When my children were small, they used to say to Anna, when they saw her dusting the house, is daddy coming home? <laughs> but to prepare your home for him, to prepare it for him, is more than the rooms. It's you. It's the preparation of ourselves. Because, number one, he wants to be <coughs> at home in your heart. And I trust that every one of us here tonight knows the satisfaction of that. That Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith. We've received the grace of the gospel. And we begin our walk with him. But in concert with the walk of going to serve him in his house, I need to know the communion of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in my house. That there's an open door there for them, just as there's an open door in 
in heaven for you and for me. Isn't it wonderful that after all the ups and downs of the Lord Jesus survey of the seven churches in Asia at the opening of the book of Revelation, that the very next words from the Apostle John is, And I saw a door open in heaven. What a relief. No longer looking inside to churches that in different ways were either pleasing or displeasing the Savior. Either living in his character or not. And at last he comes from Ephesus through Smyrna and Sardis to Laodicea. And he says, he says to them, you get a name. He says, there are people and you're among them and you say that you're rich. You're poor. And you're blind. And you're naked. And the Lord Jesus could hardly have given a more negative report of the church of God in Laodicea. And it's been read in the other six too, so there are no secrets. I wonder what he would be saying in the present day if he was writing letters about each of the assemblies. When you come to the thought of him wanting to be at home in your heart. The other side of that is he wants to be at the heart of your home. And in the heart of your home, it means seeing how you live there. Determining, engaging your communion with him in your home. The interaction Father, mother, children, seeing a family, living in such a way that as the Lord Jesus looks in, he's able to see something that's consistent with what we are at church. It's one of the sadnesses in full-time service. The letters that I've had over the years, just as other brethren undoubtedly have, from sisters speaking about their unhappy marriages. I remember one dear sister whose husband was a preacher, and she told me, she said, there used to be people came at the end of a service, and they say, how well off you are to have such a man as your husband. And she says, in my mind I was replying, if only you saw him at home. Try it again. If only you saw him at home. What do you think about our homes tonight? Uh, some of us might be single, irrespective, he still wants to look in our homes. Wants to look inside the marriage home. Wants to be able to see to what extent we have grown in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As couples. As families. You know there's a beautiful picture in Psalm 128. You get this picture of a husband with his wife. The husband is expected to be the breadwinner according to the reading of the psalm. But then it says, your wife will be as a fruitful vine in the innermost part of the house, and your children will be as olive plants round about your table. And I think, well, why did you say olive plants? Why did you not choose something else? And I think it was in keeping with the rest of the teaching from the olive in the Old Testament of our Bible that from the olive came the oil and from the oil, the oil came the light for the lampstand. So there's a testimony round about the table to the working of the Spirit of God. We were thinking about Zechariah last night. What are these, the two olive trees, standing beside the lampstand with the golden bowl 
And Zechariah is uh, so overwhelmed in Zerubbabel 2, and it says that they bring forth a headstone crying, Grace, grace to it. And in the crying of grace at the temple, there's an echo of what should have been going on inside, in, inside the home at the table. Because the children are just like the sons of oil. They're the evidence of the working of the Holy Spirit in the family. And I trust that in each one of our lives, we've had the joy and the satisfaction of seeing the Spirit of God at work in our family. Aye, there are disappointments, aren't there? Times when we, we feel let down as parents. But what about God the Father? Will we as parents let him down too? You know, there was a man reported to have been travelling in an old carriage and opposite him there was a woman busy reading, so she was ignoring him. But he noticed she was getting upset by what she was reading. And at last he couldn't contain his question any longer. And he said to her, what is it that's having such a profound effect on you? And she handed him the book. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I am constrained to be. Let that grace, Lord, like a fetter, Bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I know it. Prone to leave the God I love. Keep my heart from wandering, keep it. Till I am perfected above. And he passed her back the book. And then he said, Would to God that I were in the condition tonight that I was when I wrote these words. It was Robert Robertson, Robinson, the writer of the hymn. We know what it is to turn aside from the Lord at some stage in our lives, I think. And you look back on it with deep regret. <coughs> and the Lord in his grace restores the years that the locusts have eaten. But sometimes they're nibbling away inside the marriage. And maybe there's something that you're constantly bringing before the Lord in prayer regarding your home, your partnership, your family, and it burdens you no end. There's grace in every trial, as we thought last night. And we don't forget that when we come into chapter 3, we're bringing it forward. Because the grace I knew in my salvation, the grace I knew in my service, the grace I knew in every trial that comes along, warranted and unwarranted, I step into chapter 3 and I say, thank you, Lord. This is the very same grace that helps me in my marriage to my wife, in my marriage to my husband, and it means everything to me. But then you go on. And he's wanting to make sure that I know. That there's an interlocking here. That when I think about worship. And witness. When I think about my walk and my work. I parcel them on to, all together. And I refer them back to verse 2 as we were thinking last night. And I know that earnestly desiring the pure milk of the word is going to help me in every link of the chain. It's no different when I come to my wife. No different. I have to make sure that what I am at work is what I am at church. And I have to make sure that what I am in the home is what I am at work and what I am at church very easy to live one life in assembly and to be a different kind of person Monday to Friday but from one end of the week to the other it's equally possible to be a different person at home to be different in such a way 
that the things I should be guarding I let slip. And I fail to measure up to the consistency that God has called me to as I've been reading through this letter. So all of a sudden, what I expect in chapter 2 to be the standards of his home and of his family as he brings us together as children of God and disciples as, and in our baptism we go forward and we enter into the glory and the privilege of uh, remembering the Lord in the breaking of the bread, of continuing steadfastly in the prayers, in the apostles' teaching, of knowing the value of mixing with each other and benefiting from one another in fellowship. And then I sit with my wife. What is it like? You see, when we come to linking up, we need to go back again and realize that the thing that unlocks your marriage and mine is the self-same word that unlocked your worship in chapter 2. And just as that word feeds your worship and we come Lord's Day by Lord's Day with something to bring, some new thought about Christ, not always what he's done for me, that will be a great part of it, we know. But to see something of the worth of the Lord Jesus that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about and helped you to enjoy from your daily reading and you come into the presence of God and you're just so thankful that you can talk to the best person of all about his son. And there'll never be a knockback. He'll never criti criticize what you say. The Spirit of God will help you to speak and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as high priest will help it to be presented to God in a way that you and I could never do. So we all have an impediment. So don't hold back. We worship by the Spirit of God. But here in my home is the word that's going to hold it together. When uh, Peter is speaking... Uh, he speaks about the wife being submissive to her husband. It's not the most enjoyed word in today's vocabulary. Sad when you speak on it and a Christian comes and challenges you. To think that any sister would ever feel that she is of secondary importance to God. To think that the Apostle Paul or Peter would ever engage in the put-down of sisters and the elevating of brethren. This is the inspired word of God that they're writing. It's not just their view. And I don't for one minute subscribe to the view that someone once wrote in an article in Christian literature that I saw that Paul was more chauvinistic than the Saviour. I don't believe for a second that there's any degrading of women in the Word of God. There's a harmony of teaching where one complements the other and where in our service to God there may be not the slightest difference between the value of what a sister gives and that that comes from your brethren. There are women who have served the Lord monumentally. Monumentally. And God knows all about it. And he knows your service too. And it's not second rate to your husband. Never for a moment. And when Paul and Peter picked up their pen to be moved by the Spirit of God, they were writing in concert with the will of God. And Peter says, Wives, be submissive to your husband. He says, Okay, Peter, I'm there. I'll do that. 
because he's also expecting that the husbands will be submissive to God. But he knows there can be a difficulty. And so he says to the wife, he says, you know, you have an adornment. But it's not the doing up of your hair. It's not the putting on of your jewellery. It's not finding the best dress in the wardrobe. It's not how you look. It's how you are inside. It's the inner man. It says in my Bible, the inner person. But really, it's, it's the new man inside the woman, if you know what I mean. It's the new person that was created in Christ. And the nature of that new person is Christ. And he's shining out. And it says here, a meek and a quiet spirit. And you can hear the echo from Matthew 11 coming racing through the Gospels to the letter. I am meek and lowly in heart. The only reference the Lord Jesus ever made to his heart throughout the Gospels was when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. This is what's in your heart. And he says, I want to tell you what's in mine. It's the meekness and gentleness of Christ that's asking you to come because in the lowliness and meekness of my heart, I'm longing for you to come. And I'm going to make provision for you to come. In this sacrificial grace, I'll be at Calvary. And in the ultimate expression of eternal grace, I'll be on the throne. And I'll be on both places for you. I'll be there to help you be delivered from your sin. And I'll be on the throne to help you in your service. And while the New Testament never once refers to the Lord Jesus running, yeah, he walked and he knelt and he sat and he stood and he lay. Never tells us that he ran. But when he went home from Calvary, it says he went in as the forerunner. This is new language. This is resurrection language. And in the resurrection, he sat down in heaven's throne to continue an unfinished work to this day. And in that work it says that he's able to succor, able to aid, able to help. And it literally means able to run, to be the helper of them that have faith in Jesus. That's you and me. In our worship, in our witness, in our walk, in our work and in our marriages, wives, be submissive. Because in this you're displaying the character of your Saviour. It's a privilege to be submissive. An absolute privilege. Then he says of her to the husband, and he's talking about all that she is. It's just, he says, you know, it's not you're a dormant, it's not standing at the mirror, it's standing at this, this mirror, looking into the mirror of the world. And it's not the decorating of the outside, it's the cultivating of the inside. And as if the whole conversation is with the wife, he suddenly says, husbands, likewise. That's how he started verse 1, wives, Likewise, he says, there's no favoritism here. There's an onus on both of them. And he's, he's wanting this dear woman to understand that in the eyes of her husband, in the eyes of God, he's going to treat her as the weaker vessel. He's speaking physically, he's not speaking spiritually. Not even speaking mentally or emotionally. I don't believe God is putting down the woman's characteristics whatsoever. He's mainly accepting a fact of life that men, women are not built like men. And manual labor is normally the responsibility of the husband rather than the wife. And so he looks at the husband and he says, I want you to dwell with your wife with understanding. 
It's as if he's saying, I want you to live with a, a knowledge of your wife, of her personality, to understand her temperament, to be able to define her outlook, to recognize her weaknesses and her strengths, to know her abilities and her deficiencies, and above all, to know her spirituality. And here's a man who's dwelling with his wife. It was really according to investigation. It's not interrogation. It's investigation. He wants to know his wife so that he can minister to her. Sometimes it happens, we thank God for it. But Peter's not blind to the fact that it's not always happening. And so he's talking about, first of all, last night, a building that's resembling what the Lord Jesus is building between Pentecost and his return. This massive church which is the body of Christ. And Paul looks at it and Peter looks at it. And Peter's looking at it through the eyes of the Lord God working with living stones. He's putting them together in service. And he says, this is a reminder that the building that the Savior is putting together is made to last. It's not a transient thing. It's not an earthbound thing. It's eternal. Guaranteed a home forever. <coughs> but then you come uh, to the language of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians and he speaks about uh, the local assembly being body of Christ in its character. And so he's thinking here, there's something that's made to live. You know, we know what a building stands for, but we know what a body stands for. A building is something that will outlast the span of a normal man's life. But here, this man represents in the body what the Saviour is combining for himself from men and women of all over the world. And he's bringing them together through the preciousness of his blood into this glorious relationship of a church that's the fullness of him that fills all in all. And you and I bow with thankfulness that we're in it. We're part of that. And in my assembly life, I'm trying to reflect it. We're seeking to reflect it. But then he comes to the third stage. And in 1 Peter here, he's focusing on the relationship between a husband and his wife. Just as Paul does in Ephesians chapter 5. And he relates it to the union that there is between the Lord Jesus and his church. And so in this marital union, there's a reflection, a resemblance of what God sees in the eternal union that at last will be presented when the Lord Jesus presents her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He's showing us here there's language in the Old Testament where God was speaking to his Old Testament people, to Israel, and he says to them, your maker is your husband. So there was a, a bond between God and the people of Israel that was as if it were like a husband and wife partnership. And then you come through other scriptures such as in Isaiah where he says, uh, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so the Lord will rejoice over you. And there are other scriptures too. Uh, and you come at last to what he says in Ezekiel where God says to his people, he says, I washed you, anointed you, I decked you with jewels and apparel and here's, here's the clothing of the people under the, the gracious hand of God. And you say, what is he saying? He's reminding them that there's something in them that's pointing forward to something greater. And you go back to the days when God was speaking to Moses about his people. He said, look, I would like you to 
bring them out. Bring them out to Sinai. And I want you to come up into the mountain. And it says that Moses took them out to meet God. And then you come through chapters later and it says something else that uh, God said in the place that he would meet with them. There I will meet with you. The amazing thing is that God was talking about two different things. He has something else in his mind when he's meeting with them at uh, Sinai. He uses the word kira in the Hebrew language, which just means to have an encounter with God. I shouldn't say just means. What could be greater than having an encounter with God? A meeting with them that makes an impact on you. That's what Moses was taking them out for, that they might have such a sense of God. I remember many years ago going to a conference and dear old Mr. Highland was speaking. And what I remember in his message is this, that he said, what I want this year is a greater sense of God. We need men and women that will bring us a sense of God in the assemblies. We need men and women that are so much in the Word that whether it's from their worship to their role as wives or husbands, that God is packing that all together as opportunities for us to meet God. And that's what was happening at Sinai through Moses the mediator. But then God brought them to another place and they gathered around the altar one day outside the tabernacle. And God was putting lambs on the altar that were pointing forward to the Lord Jesus, the Lamb himself. And God says to Moses, tell the people, I'll meet with you there. And he used an entirely different word. He used the Hebrew, Hebrew word kara. And that means, uh, I'll be engaged to you. How shall two walk together unless they are agreed, says Amos. Equally, it can be translated, how can two walk together unless they're engaged? It's a marital bond. It's the anticipation of the marriage. And here was God at the altar, in the place of sacrifice, making an arrangement with his people that he was, he was doing something, first of all, under law. He was gathering them as the people of God. He was going to bring them forward to make a covenant with them from God. And he was going to show them that at last there would be a bridal relationship with God. And what he began with law, he completed in the land. How much more clear could the picture be that God is building for the cross and the outcome of the cross? That in those who would be saved through the grace of God in their salvation would at last demonstrate and reveal to this world the glory of his grace. When Paul was writing, as we were saying, to the church in Corinth, and in my Bible it says, you are the body of Christ. And then you come, uh, and it says, it's the fullness of him who fills all in all. For as the body has many members, he says, uh, so also is Christ. The difference between the two verses is that the first verse has the word the, the definite article in it, and the second one doesn't. But really what you should do is delete it from the first and install it in the second. Because in the original language, Paul was simply saying, you are body of, you're not the body of Christ. Because there are believers elsewhere other than you. So the body is wider than Corinth. But in nature and character, you are body of Christ. You're a small representation in this world of the unity, the harmony, the holiness of the church, which is the body of Christ. And that's what you have to display. And so he comes to those in chapter 12 
and he says, as the body is one and has many members, so also is the Christ. And he's actually referring to the church as the Christ. He's not speaking about the Savior anymore. He's talking about those who belong to the Savior, that they're reflecting because God has designed that they would reflect. And the body in its full testimony doesn't have any earthward manifestation in its entirety. But from Pentecost to the rapture, there's a collective testimony of the church, which is the body of Christ, being made known in the heavenly places to the principalities and powers. They're witnessing the outcome of Calvary. You and I are waiting to see it. And so is every other believer. But at present, he says to us, this is what I want you to be like in your character. <clears throat> when Paul was writing to the Ephesians, it was rather sad that he had to tell them not to lie to one another. Imagine telling believers, don't lie to one another. Don't be deceptive. Either in what you say or how you live. Don't give an impression that's not real. Then he goes on to say, uh, but speaking truth in love, speaking truth in love, each one to his neighbor. You know, we're members of the body of Christ. We're living stones that belong to the building. We're part of the bride of Christ. But here he's actually saying that we're neighbors of one another. And it's an unusual word to use about those who belong uh, to Christ, but that's what he does here. He says, be neighborly, one to another, speak truth, uh, so that we build each other up, because he says we are members one of another. And then he takes that language forward, and he comes into the next chapter in Ephesians, and he says, so husbands, and he's back to the marriage partnership, and he says, so husbands, he says, well, to love your, your wives, you have to nourish and cherish them. Which really means you have to pamper them, isn't that a great word for the woman to make hay from? You have to pamper your wife. But you have to do it in such a way that he says here, you're acknowledging that you are members of his body. And here in your marriage and mine, our highest relationship with one another, we are members of the body of Christ. How significant is that? When Paul is writing and Peter is writing to men and women that were in churches in that day in a living, vibrant testimony for God, but to remind them of what they were expected to be, he speaks in body language to them to let them know that the God of heaven, his highest design is that in this church on earth, you and I will reflect the characteristics of the church that is eternal. Now, as we do it, he says uh, in Peter, uh, in, in the Corinthian letter, he says, I betrothed you to one husband. And so here's Paul taking up the role that in the assembly, he has men and women that are serving the Lord, and he wants to present them to Christ. He knows he's not the presenter of the church, the body. That's, that's the Savior's work. And he deals with it in, I think it's chapter, verse 14 of the same chapter. And so he's not trying to usurp the Savior's work. He's simply saying that what he's going to do in heaven, I want to do now. I want to make sure that the people I'm working with in the assembly, like Branford, is that my highest desire for them is to present them perfect in Christ. What a name for anyone's ministry. And yet the Apostle Paul knows that apart from presenting them to the Saviour in all their purity, that the bride would have a whole range of characteristics that God wants to see in each, in each one of us really, not only in the women folk. So he starts off and he goes through the whole thing about her affection, her compatibility, her faithfulness, maturity and purity. And then he sums up with her responsibility and selflessness. And you put all that together, 
You see, this is what Peter's looking for inside this home. That God has come into the home in 1 Peter chapter 3, and these are the very things that he's looking for. But there's a difficult thing. Peter knows there are husbands that are not saved. He knows there are husbands that are not saved. And he's not advocating that the wife should marry an unbeliever. He's simply recognizing that while the woman has been saved, reached and saved through the gospel, the husband has yet to be reached and saved through the same gospel. And the wife might be the instrument that will draw him to, to the Savior. But how will she go about it? He says, with or without the word. With or without the word. But a wife will be wise to know when she should quote the word and when she should hold back from quoting the word. Because the very quoting of a scripture might be an irritant rather than an assistant. He's not saying the man will be saved without the word. We know that's not possible. We have been born again, begotten again by the word of truth. It's the only way to be saved. Is through the word. So he's not saying that the man will be one without the words. He's just saying the wife needs to know when. Let my language speak. My body language speak. My behavior, my chaste behavior. Accompanied by reverence. With respect for my husband. She's married a man. Probably an unbeliever to an unbeliever. And now she's the believer who's trying to win him. She's no longer the person that he married in the first place. And so, Peter says, it's your behavior that will talk. Let it do the talking. When you know that you're unlikely to win him with the word. And then he says that apart from her chaste behavior coupled with fear, he speaks to her about that hidden person in the heart that's going to do the work. We owe everything to the grace of God. We're in chapter 1. Hopefully, we're reflected in chapter 2. And I trust as we just take those seven verses tonight, take them away home, to think about your home life and your marriage if you're still married. And you know what it is to be able to take these verses and unpack them for yourself. And for those of you who are no longer married, perhaps your partners have gone, perhaps you've never been married, he wants you to go home and pray for the couples that undoubtedly are having a struggle to win their partners for Christ. That the God of all grace and all wisdom will do his work through the wife. Or perhaps it might be through the husband to the unbelieving. But nevertheless, the, the fulfillment of marital grace will be discovered in the experience of their whole lives too. Let's pray.